Thank to everybody and welcome back to this second uh, session of the day. Uh, we're very excited to have such a great panel lined up for us today to discuss this very relevant and pertinent topic, which uh, runs hand in hand intrinsically with the NPL uh, question in uh, Greece and Cyprus. Um, we have a, a really great panel, which I will let uh, our panel moderator, Yanis Daskalakis, uh, go ahead and introduce. Uh, we're all looking forward to it. So uh, thank you for joining us, everybody. Yanis. Thank you, Martin. Good morning to everyone. At first, let's take a minute to congratulate Martin, DDC, and all of the team for organizing this great event. I would like uh, to thank you for inviting me to be part of this great panel. And of course, it's my great pleasure to moderate a panel that represents the real estate side of a greater uh, talk about uh, the non-performing loans in Greece. I really hope that at the end of this uh, discussion, you will be able, all of you, uh, to have a greater view of all the problems, the challenges, and of course, the opportunities deriving from the real estate market in Greece right now. And for that reason, we have lined up this panel with some of the greatest names of the real estate industry in our country. So let's take a minute to know them, to understand who they are and where they come from, and uh, we will jump in directly to the uh, discussion. So, ladies first, Ms. Paderaki, please give us 30 uh, seconds of your time to let us know who you are and how you are involved in real estate. So, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure and an honor to be part of this panel. So, thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm the Chief Real Estate Officer for Duvalu Greece Real Estate Services. It's a company that was created within the Duvalu Greece to cover the real estate needs of both the portfolios that Duvalu is uh, covering in Greece, but also manage our own needs of uh, other investors that do not necessarily, we do not necessarily hold the portfolios. <coughs> We've been active for a year now and we have a full team already in place. Uh, which can support, uh, as I've mentioned, all the pre-REO and REO needs of the value grace and our investors. So, thank you. Mr. Baba Christou. Good morning to all of you. Thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to participate in the panel. Uh, I'm the chairman and CEO of BuildUp. BuildUp is a real estate development and investment company providing special services also to uh, NPL uh, owners and NPL services regarding the technical and ownership due diligence of uh, their assets. Our company goes back to 1970. We have uh, a long period in uh, the market. And uh, I think we have uh, a big uh, expertise in the, these uh, issues that we are going to discuss. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Markopoulos. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Yanis. Uh, thanks for the invitation, Martin. Uh, we really appreciate to be here in this very interesting panel, in this very interesting event. So I'm uh, one of the three co-founders of Prosperity, uh, and I am also the CEO of the company. Prosperity is a PropTech business. Uh, PropTech means uh, technology um, a company that uh, is being involved in the real estate business. Uh, we started uh, the product, our platform, you know, seven months ago, and we are growing fast. Uh, our target is to digitize, you know, to make the whole process uh, between the onboarding of, uh, of an asset up to the closing uh, of, of the transaction. Uh, so uh, the, the company is mainly a tech company. Uh, with uh, a lot of uh, expertise in both in the tech, but also in the real estate uh, business. We are 30 people, uh, we're growing fast, as I told you, and we're very happy to um, discuss today about how technology and data will transform the real estate, uh, not only in Greece, uh, but also globally. Thank you, Mr. Haralabopoulos. Hello, everyone. Uh... Thanks, Yanis, for the intro. Um, so, I'm Panos Haralabopoulos. I'm the Managing Director of uh, Solon Property Solutions uh, in association with Prime Yield here in Greece. Uh, the range of professional services that we provide um, include property valuation, valuation audits, uh, property management, uh, market research, technical due diligence. And uh, through our joint venture with Prime Guild, we provide valuation, research, and advisory services for informed decision making in NPL transactions. Uh, 
uh, strongly supported by Prime AVM and Analytics, which is an advanced technological solution for property valuations and under underwriting. Thank you, Mr. Manjuratos. Thank you, Yanis. Hello, everyone, and good morning. I'm delighted to be among um, colleagues and friends that we have either cooperated in the past or we're currently cooperating, or we have established working relationships. And um, from my end, uh, my name is Chris Manjuratos. I'm a director in Arbitrage Real Estate, with Arbitrage Real Estate, currently leading the commercial appraisal and underwriting project engagements. Um, for, the, for our firm, let me put it this way, we are a real estate advisory and management firm providing a wide uh, spectrum of services for uh, the property sector. Uh, our offering can be broken down in four main categories based on the actual uh, service. It is, of course, the commercial advisory that has to do with valuation research and uh, underwriting. The technical advisory, uh, uh, which includes technical due diligence and sustainability uh, advisory projects. Again, we have the development management, which includes planning and cost management, and of course, the uh, project management that is uh, currently um, uh, showing a bit of uh, uh, growth in uh, every uh, asset class that we are engaged. And the uh, last bit is the asset management offering that we have uh, that has to do with broadly uh, put agency brokerage and uh, commercialization of assets. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Mr. Mundis? Yeah, hi there. Hi, Yannis. Thanks for the invite once more. A great session by DTC. Uh, I'm the managing partner of Delphi Partners. We're a leading real estate asset management practice now based in uh, four countries with a 150 plus strong team. And essentially what we do is that we offer a tanky solution when it comes to real estate asset management from underwriting and onboarding of assets all the property management, the asset optimization, of course, the monetization. Um, I mean, this year we have also invested heavily in technology and we have launched in Cyprus our new platform uh, that does uh, private auctions, it's called Delphi Auctions. And uh, our clients are uh, institutional investors, financial institutions and servicers in all four countries. Thank you. Thank you, and a little bit about myself. My name is Yannis Daskalakis. I'm the co-founder and managing partner of Daskalakis & Associates, a firm operating and offering A to Z services in real estate through three different teams. The engineering team offering uh, building surveying and technical, technical diligence and construction and development services. Our evaluation team, which offers property valuations, asset pricing and uh, market advisory and our newest team, the real estate team, which we like to think that in the coming years will be established as a leading real estate agency team in, uh, in our country. So let's go ahead with our discussion. Uh, Mr. Mudis, I will start with you. Um, our, panelist teams, uh, our panelist team talks about uh, an outlook to changes in real estate. So, let us know, it's, it's not one size fits all question, but uh, give us a snapshot of what has changed in the real estate industry last year and how does this affect it, um, the non-performing loan market and the servicers? Okay, I mean, Yanis, thanks, an interesting question. Um, I mean, the most important thing that we had essentially last year and early this year is the fact that uh, you know, foreign investors couldn't travel to Greece, so they couldn't inspect assets. So certain asset classes, especially the resi assets above a million, were tricky to monetize. However, having said that, there was increasing demand from locals buying uh, smaller assets, less than half a million euros. And resi, I mean, uh, the issue was we, we couldn't transfer ownership and we didn't have enough stock. So. Uh, residential assets have been, especially the more granular assets have been, the demand has been steady and I would say has increased. Uh, obviously the office space, given the pandemic, there wasn't that much of a demand, especially for grade A and grade B plus offices. Huge demand and increased demand for logistics, especially in prime logistically, logistical areas. Uh, I mean, those, uh, uh, the, 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 let's say the secondary and tertiary kind of logistical and industrial assets haven't got the demand that we wanted, but there was demand there. 
And uh, most importantly, I mean, because we hear this question that there will be a lot of tourism leisure assets or small hotels or condos being available for sale. I mean, we haven't yet seen that. Uh, however, there is strong demand and we have worked on a couple of very big mandates uh, uh, on, uh, on, uh, on actually disposing NPLs related back by, by hotels. But overall, I will say now, especially the pandemic started kind of, um, um, let's say, with the vaccination scheme and all the traveling restrictions being kind of lifted, uh, we're expecting a kind of a, a big foreign demand, especially in the island areas that buying in the Aegean Islands or the Ionian Islands buying prime resin. So I will say the pandemic, yes, it has changed the the overall market but i wouldn't say radically especially in certain asset classes yeah retail uh, smaller kind of retail for sme type of uh, uh, let's say owner occupiers has been actually hit uh, because they have been closed for ages and uh, but I, i'm i'm uh, optimistic overall and i would say that uh, uh, the liquidity and the demand is there. It's just uh, we need to reform a few bits and pieces. And I will mention, I think we'll have a question a bit later on concerning transferability of the assets, obtaining tax clearances, legalization issues, and so forth. These are the things that we need to tackle first. So as the whole uh, transferability kind of work stream being optimized in Greece. So mm -hmm. it's it's strong demand, but we have to fix some points, you say? Yeah, I would say strong demand, not in all asset classes, just to clarify, right? Okay, yeah. but uh, I mean, for us, the biggest obstacle, and this is, I think, is generally in the market, having known all the professionals here, is the transferability element. It's too slow and we need to bring that way forward. So as the time to sell will be much shorter than the actual uh, horizon as is now. Ms. Yeah. Uh, what I was going to add, George is very correct, what I was going to add, uh, which is not, it's on the real estate side, but on a different angle, I mean, obviously he's right, and one of the things that the pandemic has showed is that a lot of transactions were put on hold just because you couldn't uh, transfer assets. Um, and you couldn't fulfill all the required steps to legalize um, the whole process. The other thing, there are two other things uh, which go more on what we do. And one was that this whole last year with the suspension of auctions has created an issue also on availability of assets. So we saw that not only in the open market, I mean, the assets that are available have been available forever. And, you know, you've reached a point where you can find assets. But then the areas that were created were a lot less just because you couldn't, you know, repossess through auction, so you couldn't sell to the open market through auction since we didn't have an auction. So that has changed, um, has, has, has altered the supply-demand equilibrium with the supply being a lot lower. Therefore, demand has increased and, and we keep seeing that, uh, George mentioned it, that, you know, we have demand that cannot be uh, served right now by the current uh, existing portfolios of REOs. And the other thing that I have observed in that one last year is because there has been such a discussion on REOs and, you know, the next, um, the next thing that is coming to the market and the fact that from MPLs will, will shift into uh, real estate owned assets that eventually will have to hit the market is that likely we have seen the development of um, extended networks of providers. So not only the distinguished uh, guests here and the bigger firms, but we've seen also smaller firms that tackle specific um, issues or specific parts of the whole REO management process um, scheme, which have been started appearing in the Greek market, something that was missing. Facility management companies, something that didn't exist in this market up until what, five years ago, uh, with the exception of the big schemes, I mean. So facility management companies, engineers that are more uh, um, 
you know, focused on what the needs are of REOs, uh, brokers that do understand what an auction is and can not only sell REOs, but can sell um, assets on pre-REO. So I think that has also changed. And the fact that we had, I mean, the negative side of the pandemic was the lack of product. The positive side is that it gave time to people to organize or to companies to organize and have a new product in the market, which is uh, those service providers that, um, you know, could assist companies like ourselves, like value uh, in giving um, the, the management of, 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 the, of the assets that is needed. If uh, I may add on this, uh, first of all, uh, I totally agree with, uh, we totally agree with George and uh, Lila, as he said, in terms of the actual demand that has been recorded for logistics, for sure, for during the pandemic, as well as quality residential and uh, the office that uh, uh, great day office spaces in good locations, in private locations, there was a bit of demand. However, on the hospitality side and mainly on the large, uh, large hotels in important destinations, even though the auctions were not uh, uh, going on, uh, there was a demand, uh, as we have seen it, from investors that they, do, that they did their analysis and they factored in uh, in the price offered both the capex needs for uh, repositioning or rebranding of uh, assets, hospitality assets that needed to be upgraded. And uh, there was an additional discount on the price offered, which was basically the trigger both from the historically low KPIs in 2020 and the kind of short-term, uh, uh, let's say, if no, negative outlook for the uh, year ahead. So uh, there was demand from what we have seen for large hotels in important destinations that need to be upgraded, that uh, given the discounts that they, they have factored in, both for the CapEx and the, uh, slow, the uh, low KPIs, in essence, the, there was an entry in an investment with a relatively locked up upside potential coming in the two or three years down the road. So this is for the asset class and for the portfolios, if I may say. Um, we, the evolution of the portfolios on the April portfolios that we have seen during the underwriting exercises, uh, there has been a shift in the mix of the RE uh, component inside the portfolios. We have seen, uh, and this is mainly, one reason could be the, the Hercules program that has been back in uh, starting in December, if I'm not mistaken, 2019. Uh, there has been a change in the mix. If we see the large portfolios that came in the market and uh, successfully had the deals and the transactions, such as Amoeba and Jupiter, most of us know them, uh, that were more corporate loan profile, had the more corporate loan profile and included a lot of marketable commercial area assets. I mean, George will be able to give us uh, as well his view on this. Uh, now we are seeing a, a new wave of NPLs that include more legacy or, let's say, granular assets, uh, multifamily units, smaller unit apartments that are not that marketable. So, uh, and I'm coming to Lila's part, but I don't know if uh, I'm covering this, but uh, it seems that on the REO, the secondary REO market, it seems that for the first portfolios that were more cooperatives, uh, we had uh, the auction or the concessional process worked a bit effectively, more effectively, if I may say, uh, albeit small market we have there, uh, but for the more granular portfolios that uh, we have assets that are small apartments or storages or even, let's say, other dilapidated industrial assets, uh, this seems to be need more work out on the reprofiling and uh, restructuring of the actual uh, cases. Um, so, uh, since Chris uh, made the introduction on that, uh, Ms. Padraki, please uh, tell us, we, uh, we are bouncing back after a year, it seems like that. So, uh, which is the physiology in the real estate perspective of uh, the running uh, NBL portfolios right now and uh, what are we waiting for? Well, Chris described it, so I'm not going to, to repeat it. Um, he very correctly said that we're moving from more corporate and big RE assets into more granular and smaller ticket sizes. I mean, if we uh, if we take out the corporate portfolios from our uh, from the MPLs, where the value is managing, and we also see, 
the portfolios that are currently in the market to be sold, we'll see that the average ticket size is about 90 to 100K uh, per asset, so quite small. On the other hand, it's, I mean, Chris mentioned it as a challenge. I think there's also an opportunity there, uh, but it needs work from us. So what do I mean? So the challenge is that you were referring before your clientele was more sophisticated, people that were more familiar with uh, the auction process that were willing to bid and get those assets. And you could also find solutions in short sale. But however, the experience we have on the retail is one that people are also willing to find conceptual solutions. So you will have conceptual assets that are coming to the market retail. And it goes back to what we mentioned before that you have a lack of product. So the idea here, and I think George mentioned that we started seeing more demand, for example, in Resi, but there are no Resi right now in the free market. So the auctions and the portfolios that are coming, which are more granular, um, including their very good assets. Don't forget that, okay, not all of them, but some of them were bankable back then. So that means that eventually somebody did something with those assets. Uh, and at the right price, you can also, uh, you have a lot bigger clientele base that you can um, tackle or you can uh, guide that interest. So you have the small apartments, you have the landlords or you have the small retail that people are looking for. Uh, you can find the buyers. The, ex the, the process of the auction is becoming, has become very transparent and gradually with the government interventions, some of the problems we see in repossessing assets are becoming our solved. maybe not all of them. So there is still work to be done, but our solved, which means that it's up to us now. And that's the challenge we have and the opportunity to train both our networks, going back to what I was saying before, both and both our networks, but also the people that, uh, you know, how to deal with auctions, for example, how to deal with that. It's not a bad thing to go and buy an asset from an auction, which is the perception in the market, whether we want to admit it or not. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's um, a, 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 a a transaction that is based on market values. It's a transaction that it does not. It means that you're not selling apartments at 20% on uh, a 20% discount, uh, 80% discount, sorry, and things like that. So the, I, I think that moving away from the corporates and going into the granular assets, um, if handled correctly, and that's where our bets are put right now, when that's our effort, that's why, you know, we even started our own platform, advertising assets, Altamira platform, which is, is also for tackling those small assets. So I think that's a very, a great opportunity that we can tap on instead of being afraid of. If, if I may a note on this, uh, since Lila mentioned it, oh, we totally agree that this, apart from the challenge, is an opportunity. And to this end, it's true that services, as like you said, have started building their internal teams, their advisory arm. However, this advisory arm, of course, uh, uh, taking into consideration the number of assets coming to the market, will have a more high level and monitoring role on a portfolio management based or an execution of the strategy. So, uh, in this essence, this is why we are here to help uh, in a way. And um, provide targeted and uh, added value advice as we currently do with uh, do value in order to all of us, I mean, all the panels, I'm sure, uh, become trusted and effectively part of the process. <laughs> at the end of the day, we all want to be great at what we do best. So probably uh, we are um, cooperating each other. So, yeah. Guys, let me just uh, add something to what you're saying. Uh, basically, I kind of disagree with uh, what George and Lila is bringing to the table regarding uh, lack of supply. I mean, uh, looking at the classifieds, uh, Spitova, the CCF area, wherever most of the granular assets are sold, and I'm not talking about high-end uh, grade A offices like uh, Chris uh, said, or, uh, or new properties that true, there is a lack of supply and uh, huge demand. But uh, if, if you look at any portal, you'll see that there's an abundance of properties. Uh, I agree that there's not enough uh, new REOs coming in uh, for uh, 
for, for the players that we discussed about. But in general, the market, I mean, is flooded with lots of assets. And I mean, uh, B, uh, tertiary and secondary assets, I mean, they're, they're everywhere. Uh, and as far as the, the e auction clause is concerned, that's unfortunately um, the way it is in, uh, in in Spain as well in Portugal too. I mean, no no individual uh, buys resi from an e auction process. I mean, uh, large institutional players will buy from an e auction process and then resell them after they they work out the asset a bit. But it, it's it's not it's not a user friendly process by all means here in Greece. I mean, uh, you go into the platform and you need to be a detective to find out what's being sold. Uh, so um, I don't see that changing uh, soon if something, I mean, seismic uh, doesn't happen. Okay, I may add, okay please, please, Adonis. Yes, may I add my two, two cents here in, in that very interesting discussion. Uh, first of all, you know, here in, in Prospect, we're analyzing the data. And since we have more than 100,000 people visiting our platform every month, we understand what kinds of assets they are looking for. So I totally agree that the, the biggest opportunity for the upcoming years uh, is going to be in the granular uh, asset class. Uh, this is the biggest opportunity. And the reason that I'm saying that is um, the data says that uh, the local buyer, which is, uh, you know, at the moment, the one that uh, is showing strong interest since uh, the international buyer has uh, postponed a little bit uh, his uh, his interest. I mean, for the raises, uh, it shows that um, the, the the cash power for the local buyer is around 100k. So, if you take into account that in 2020, 680 million of mortgages uh, have been given from the four system banks to local uh, buyers, and the average mortgage in Greece is 85,000. Uh, given also the LTV of 70%, you understand what, what is the average uh, cash power for a local buyer to, to buy something. So uh, here in Prospect, we strongly believe that this is the, this is the opportunity. Uh, how efficiently we can, everybody in this ecosystem, in this value chain can manage that uh, is, is a question mark. But uh, from the demand side, this is what the people are looking for. Of course, the big logistic centers, the big hotels, the five-star hotels, you know, all the institutional investors, local, but also international investors are looking to buy something uh, quite big. Uh, but uh, if you take into account that, you know, the 80 billion of NPL market, 90 billion NPL market consists of the biggest majority of this granular asset, this is going to be the challenge, but also the, the opportunity. New business models will come, uh, we talk only about uh, the auctioning, we talk about uh, the REO, there are the models that are coming into place that we have seen in other regions around the world, uh, because not all of the assets are going to be sold, so uh, the services need to understand what they can do with the rest of the assets, so new things are going to come into the market, and how uh, efficiently you can manage uh, thousands of assets uh, you know distributed around the country is a big uh, is a big uh, challenge for the upcoming years and regarding now what panos told about the supply i could say that because we're following the market uh, very closely regarding again uh, the data we analyze the data that there might be a lot of supply there but uh, there are not a lot of um, uh, good um, not good, but a lot of pro properties, a lot of, a lot of assets in, in the, the right pricing. The biggest challenge on the supply side at the moment is the pricing, because what we have seen uh, from our you know short but uh, you know uh, important experience is that um, the, the the retail uh, seller is uh, selling is putting a national price that might be 15 or 20 percent above. The, the, the price that are um, are willing to, to sell the properties. And this does not encourage the buyers to get into the negotiation. So, so there is a gap there between the volume of the supply, which I thought I agree there are a lot of uh, properties uh, out in the market for many, many months uh, and cannot be sold, and, and, the, and the demand. Whoever tries to resolve this uh, 
tricky issue between the volume of supply, pricing, and the, anal the analysis of the demand side, we'll, we'll, we'll get the market. I, I will totally agree with Antonis. Uh, in our point of view, especially in the large metropolitan areas, Athena, Thessaloniki, Patra, where demand exists, the problem uh, with the properties floating in Spitogatos and Chrysia Fkeria is that uh, they are owner-occupied or owner-owned, no so uh, they are pricing the product very high. If the price is right, uh, I think that it's in these areas at least, the absorption, the absorption will be very good. Uh, in local areas, I don't know, it will be challenging, but I think that uh, can happen. I mean, Yanis, just, um, just on Bano's comment regarding the options, I fully agree with Andonis, he's spot on. There is a big disparity between what is, especially if you are a private individual and you upload your asset on Spitogatos or Chrysia Fkeria or anywhere, there is a big mismatching, I would say, there. What is the actual pricing so as the asset will be monetized? And what is the wishful pricing that me, the owner, want to have on, on the side? So on correctly priced, clean assets, immediately transferable, there are not that many. Uh, and I mean, just to make it clear, uh, all the assets that they are on Spitogatos from private individuals uh, completely mispriced. These, they will stay there for many, many years unless services like Do Value uh, repossess them if they are non-performing, okay? I mean, just a note on the auction side. I believe the auction, I agree with Panos that the auction is very tricky and is not clear and there is not enough visibility and transparency and this is what we're working on it but I think it's the future to monetize assets. And, uh, you know, we're talking not about private auctions only, but public auctions. And I would disagree again, because we have seen a big uptake. We're selling many, we can't wait until the auction starts. We have more than 50, 60 registrations in the next auctions to buy assets via the auction. And we're working with Lila and other services as well locally. And I think this is the future, you know, the cost to actually onboard the asset, the timing of it, it doesn't make sense for the institutional investors in terms of net present value and leakages to onboard the assets and then monetize them. Yeah, there are some assets that, you know, the asset management plays important and you need a kind of a makeup CAPEX strategy or a CAPEX strategy to optimize and then increase value and monetize. But I strongly, strongly believe that, you know, the whole public auction thing needs to be reformed. And I think it's the future to monetize assets through auction, especially assets, smaller assets, right? The bigger assets can become a bit tricky. You need a lot more info. You need access. You need to internally inspect them. You need to know legalization issues. So there is a bit of a gray area there. But this is why quite a few of us are here to kind of shed light to the investors to buy assets through electronic platforms. And one of them is Prosperity. And there will be quite a few of them coming on on it and uh, you know i i think this is the way forward anyway sorry Lila, i know you want to say something no what i want to say answer back to panos and you cover it is um the 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 comment about the demand side uh comes from our network of brokers that we keep hearing we have interest we do not have properties and it's for all the reasons that Adonis and George explained. So either tricky assets, assets that have not been legalized, people getting them there on the market to see if they can sell them at the price they're dreaming, but not being ready to sell. So I think that there is a lot of supposedly supply. It's just that I don't believe that it's actual supply in the market. And as, as, as people said before me, they, I think they will stay there and we have seen them being there uh forever in terms of auctions um for granular assets i think it's what george said so it's assets that um they're not that tricky in repossessing in terms of fixing them don't forget that the new legislation will, uh, allows anyhow for auctions for assets from auctions to be uh, legalized if there is a problem but generally in an apartment building of 60 70 80 square meters you don't expect to have half the apartment illegal so it, it's not that difficult to legalize let's say a semi-open space or whatever might be and i do believe that because it, it is difficult to participate and that's where the training comes in that i was talking about but on the other hand the fact that it's electronic makes it a lot more transparent than in the past 
um, and all the other ways that there were. And I think that gradually people will become, because people haven't also been um, involved in that and haven't really um, tried to see how you participate in any auction. You just see a lot of steps, you get scared, you stop. I mean, I was the same way, so I'm not saying that, you know, before I'm, I, I was involved in this. So, um, but I think it's a matter of training and, and a matter of, of uh, getting some, of getting it out there and companies like ours and the companies like uh, the people that are on this panel, uh, making either their networks or the actual individual uh, owners understand uh, what it is. But we have seen what George has said that on the demand side on auctions, we have a lot of participants. So that, you know, we're waiting, we got a lot of calls for auctions that had been postponed, that people were waiting when the auctions would be rescheduled in order to participate. So it's not, and for smaller, so for apartments of 50, 60, 100, 120,000 uh, uh, euros. So it's, it's not that exotic if I may say any more. It's starting to become more and more familiar. Yeah, I, I agree. But it's, I think it's an issue of pricing. Again, I agree with you guys. Negotiation margins were always big in Greece. Uh, but during the last two years, and especially now COVID, we have the Bank of Greece data coming out uh, yesterday uh, discussing about increasing in prices universally uh, for ESI in Greece. Um, I agree that the prices have increased and for new properties, the costs have increased, you know, you have but much better insulation, much higher efficiency. Uh, but at the end of the day, we see transactions materializing at 30, 35% discounts because uh, nobody uh, checks with a realtor or with a property valuer before uh, putting on a classified. So I'm missing that amount of money. So X is what I'm asking. Uh, no broker, I mean, most brokers would not question and challenge that figure. They're happy keeping properties for ages in their databases and them not being transacted on. So of course, on, any, on the e-auction platform, you do have the distinct advantage of the property being valued and priced by a property valuer, assessing the market value and that being the, the starting price. But then of course you have uh, no visibility, no data issue there. So uh, I agree with you guys, yeah. On this part, so, so, sorry, Janice. Uh, just because the clock is ticking, uh, and yeah. I, I know we, we, we will be able to talk about this for two or four hours. So, uh, Panos, you talked about available data when uh, pricing uh, a property or a portfolio. Um, tell us about when you are called to do asset pricing uh, or uh, property valuations in uh, property portfolios and entity portfolios. What is the amount of available data and are they enough? Okay, so basically the, the two most critical issues uh, when comparing Greece to other markets where NPL ratios have drastically decreased uh, during the last years is uh, data availability and arbitrary areas. Um, the arbitrary areas issue, we've, uh, we've, sold, we, we've sold it somehow and investors are now accustomed to it. But uh, the data availability issue is uh, still a huge one. Uh, it differs per bank, uh, per portfolio, per age of loan, when the loan was issued, per type of asset. And the more granular we go, uh, the more issues with data tapes we see. Um, to be honest, I haven't seen a, a betterment and, uh, you know, an increase in the data provided uh, during the last transactions. Uh, that's obviously the case, I believe, due to the, the nature of the portfolios coming into the market. I mean, if you if you look into huge portfolios, obviously you're not going to be getting the same amount of data that you would in CRE portfolios. Um, most of the data provided for both NBO and BO stages of bidding, uh, they derive from valuations from the sell side, uh, which have been carried out either during the loan origination or um, some other point during the life cycle, or maybe for the exact uh, transaction now, maybe indexation or extrapolation. So data is hugely dependent on property valuations. But then again, there's only so much a valuer can do when undertaking evaluation or revaluation. Uh, so in many cases, we see that we cannot locate the asset. We can most probably locate it in urban properties, but for rural ones, it can be tricky. I mean, uh, the newer uh, bank forms would have a prerequisite of uh, coordinates for every property but if you cannot locate it and you need the valuation to be sent you just uh, you know wouldn't put the center of the settlement so 
you're not 100% sure where the property is located, you cannot identify it, and all the repercussions involved, uh, so you cannot reliably price it, and you cannot reliably enforce on it unless you know exactly where it is. Um, sometimes you're not certain of the type of the asset. Uh, the area of the asset, again, it cannot be certain. Dimitris will certainly uh, speak more about that on the arbitrary issues. Um, the right on the property. Sometimes, again, it's not certain. We're not 100% sure if uh, the data provided refers to full ownership or a uh, use fact or something else. A uh, number of floors, uh, anything of qualitative nature uh, that cannot be described in a yes or no box, that's the prime candidate for getting lost in the process, especially the more granular we go. Um, you can deal with those issues in uh, more palatable projects, uh, but I, cannot think, I don't think they can be addressed uh, for, uh, for huge portfolios. And yeah. the, the, sorry? Just to add up on this, sorry, uh, sorry about, am I interrupting you? you yeah. go. Uh, I totally agree. Yeah, I, have, I have more things, but go on. Okay, go, 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 go. And I will no, go ahead, go ahead, Chris. Let's keep it no, going. No, I totally agree on the limitations and uh, that um, we have when we're doing the underwriting uh, or any every underwriting phase. And uh, we are carrying the basically, we are trying to find a value for a granular real estate portfolio. We need all these data points, as you correctly mentioned, and Dimitris will follow up on this on the technical aspect. However, in, in, in the point that you mentioned earlier, either on the ABA solutions that we have, either which are a, a technical based or the actual value that makes the valuation, this needs to be reconciling on a commercial pricing, meaning that the theoretical valuation needs to fall down to a more commercial style pricing that the buyer needs to incorporate in when either he or she, she or he, allocating value on each asset. Does this price make sense in a way? So that's 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 all I want to say. I think we. Have yeah, I agree with you. It's just that uh, we're leaving some things to assumptions because data just isn't there. And um, if you combine the unavailability of data with uh, with the speed of all the processes, um, from the bidding to the workouts to everything, um, it, it could seem like uh, shooting yourself in the foot, basically. Um, but um, these issues, of course, they're not only there for underwriting and, and pricing. Uh, you know, working a property out, auctioning, again, it, they pose issues. But it's, it's not like we're, we're totally different from, uh, from Spain or Portugal. I mean, enforcing uh, in, uh, in Spain is uh, 36 months uh, work. I mean, they, they have the problem with uh, Ocupas or uh, squatters. And authorities, you know, appear to be more on their side. Uh, Portugal is faster than that, at around 18 months. So it's not like... Um, this is uh, one of the uh, disadvantages that Greece has and other players, other markets don't have it. But our data sets are most uh, often than not, uh, you know, more difficult to navigate around than uh, in other markets. So, uh, Dimitris, uh, you represent the technical side of the, the conversation here. So, let us know about your views about the available data and how they affect when it comes to unauthorized spaces or uh, uh, surface allocation in properties or inside condition of the asset. Uh, I would uh, like to join what we, the uh, former speaker said, uh, George, uh, Lila, uh, Chris, Andonis, everybody, Panos. Uh, first of all, as I said to uh, my introduction, we are a company in the sector from uh, 1970, so we have uh, 51 years of experience in uh, real estate uh, development and investment and in the services that uh, real estate transaction needs. The problem that we have um, focused on is uh, the transferability of an asset that George said at the beginning. In order an asset to be able to uh, transfer needs some legalizations, needs some technical and ownership due diligence. And when I'm speaking about ownership due diligence, I'm not speaking about the deeds, but it's, all, uh, written, it's um, written in the cadastre or, or the land registry uh, office. Uh, I'm speaking about if what we are buying is what is in the reality, or if even a small apartment that Lila uh, made as an example is entering another apartment and it can be transferable or not. And in uh, this issue, we have two different uh, speeds. We have uh, the free market, 
that in order to uh, repossess an asset, it must be cleared both technically and uh, in the, the ownership uh, status. And we issue all the certificates that we know that we need for the transaction. And we have the assets that uh, can be uh, possessed from uh, an auction. And there is the problem because for this asset, we don't have enough data in order the people that they would like to bid and to go to an auction can um, understand if what, there is, what they are buying is good or bad. As we say, diamond or coal is totally blind. They can take something according to the Greek law. They take it as such. They don't need any certificate in order to take it from an auction. Actually, to buy something from an auction is much, much easier from buying it with a normal transaction, but can you repossess it? Or it will be garbage for you. This is the issue that we must solve. Right now, what is happening in the market? And until now, the companies, uh, the, sorry, the banks was buying their own, and, uh, uh, their own collaterals. Uh, the, the assets that they were going to the auction was bought from the owner of uh, the NPL. So we create a big platforms of REOs and the whole clearance of the um, asset was coming out through the new owner of uh, the asset that was the bank. That means a lot of money, a, a lot of uh, time needed in order to make, them, to make their asset mature and in order to be able to repossess and to resell it. What we want to suggest, and uh, the, I take the opportunity of this uh, summit and this panel, is uh, to suggest a certificate, uh, a procedure before going to an auction in order to have clearer assets in an auction. If we can achieve, if the uh, NPL uh, services can achieve a win-win cooperation with the existing owner of an asset that it's in the forced situation to go his asset to go to a uh, forced sale auction to give us the data that we need in order to know what exactly is the asset that we are seeking for and in order to create a file data that as the former speaker said we cannot have them in another way until we uh, take the asset in our ownership. That's why we create huge volumes of varios. If we can uh, arrange with the owner to give us these data by offering him, for example, a fixed price for the auction, that the minimum price that we start the auction will be an X number. This is a win-win cooperation. He, take, he knows exactly the price that his asset will go on in a, a forced uh, sale auction. And we have all the data needed in order to have a clear asset in an auction and to be able to have more bidders for the auction. So what we will suggest is a procedure that for all the assets that goes to an auction, can we can have a green auction certificate as we can say that will give to the bidders the possibility to know what exactly they will face after taking an asset from an auction. Okay. They will know exactly, they will know exactly uh, if it needs legalizations, what is the cost of these legalizations if it has ownership problems by entering another property that should be fixed with technical um, ways or if the asset is dead or that we cannot do anything and we have this uh, kind of assets as well we all know them so if, the, if before the auction we know exactly the status then I think we will have more 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 people interested in auction and we won't use the auction as a legal 
tool in order to force a sale. We can use these auctions as a marketing way of selling the assets in a cooperation with the existing owners. It's not a um, fast track sale that uh, the owner can sell by itself because we have a lot of assets that the owners, the existing owners cannot sell them because they own to other people, they own to the authorities, the tax authorities, and it cannot be sold. The only way to be cleared is through an auction. And this is what we want to solve, to have clear auctions that we will have huge demand on this and it will be a triple win cooperation. Winning for the existing owner that will have a better price taken for his asset, less cost for the NPL uh, owners and the, the NPL services, and also clear asset for the final uh, buyer investor that can be immediately repossessed. Okay. Yanni. You are muted. Yes, Adonis. Yes, uh, regarding your question about data, and I would like to open up the discussion and uh, not just uh, focusing on only auctioning. I think data are transforming the, the, the industry. And uh, I would like to, to, to give you my little bit um, my sense regarding data. A lot of people are talking about data that comes from the supply side, from the market side. So a lot of people are you know, discussing uh, if we have uh, enough data on the property level, then on the market level, then on the transaction level. Uh, from what I'm reading and what I've seen uh, from um, property business around the world is uh, that the future is uh, how eventually you combine the market data, the supply side data with the demand side data. This is the key thing for the future. Um, I, I don't want to, you know, to, to, to get into the details, but, uh, you know, there are uh, just uh, companies that are doing uh, algorithms with machine learning and how they refit their algorithms with demand side data in order to improve their ABM models, their valuation models, uh, everything that has to do with, uh, with the supply side data. So there was a report a year, two years ago from McKinsey saying that um, 60 percent of the decision regarding uh, transaction from the demand side is based on non-traditional data, non-property related data. Uh, so we need to discover which are those parameters, those um, data that uh, plays a significant role on a decision. Because why we need the data? We need the data for all the stakeholders to take wise decision. Lila has to do to pass day in order to take wiser decisions for uh, her businesses. Me as a seller, I need more data in order to um, take a wiser decision. So even the buyer wants to have data. So the, the challenge and the, the technology and the data for the future is going to be how you, uh, let's say, monitor not only the supply side and the market data in order to improve your AVMs, your, evaluation models, et cetera, et cetera. But how eventually you combine the demand side, those little, those small preferences that the, the people they have, uh, how you get data from the viewings, how you, you gather data, Jan uh, as a realtor, a real estate agent from, from each of the viewing, what uh, somebody likes, what somebody doesn't like, because a lot of things are not going into the, the closure of the transaction because of a minor issue that probably in Panos AVM model cannot be measured. It might be the size of an elevator because somebody has a kid and wants you know, the stroller to be in the elevator. There are a lot of different things. So as much as we get more smart regarding data, uh, the best, uh, the better the, the decisions are going to be among all the stakeholders in this value chain. Um, just yeah. uh, actually, sorry, because we are speaking up, uh, regarding uh, the data that we want. 
We have data that it's needed in order the buyer to have a clear uh, picture of what he's buying, if it's nice, if it's not nice, if it has an elevator or if it does not have an elevator. And we have data that it's uh, mandatory according to the authorities in order to make the transaction, in order to make an asset transferable, as George said from the beginning, this is the issue. To have the necessary data in order to know if an asset is transferable or not, on what will be the cost in order to be transferable. Yeah, I'm yes. just about, uh, sorry. Well, so uh, quickly, so Bragley, uh, we totally agree with uh, Dimitris and uh, what Adonis said. However, the data and the technology and what data we utilize in the AVMs that are critical in the output, we apart from comparables as already all of us know, anything that has to do with the transaction, public listings, which are quantifiable per se, you need data points that are related with the sentiment of a user, the sentiment of a, a, a person that goes to an Airbnb facility uh, uh, on, on, the, on the service that someone is getting from a hospitality unit. So practically this kind of, uh, if, I, if I may say the words, uh, create a sentiment that gives us the, uh, uh, let's say, comfort in the, to the pricing when we do even for hospitality assets. Of course, uh, other aspects of data, on the data side, again, have to do with demographics linked to local population growth, to income, linked to proximity of point of interest. These are factoring in the um, actual um, AVM uh, exercise that we run and the, the solutions that we have. In a way, apart from this, we have all the everything, anything that has to do with transaction volumes that you can get from the uh, uh, transaction valuation registry or even the Hellenic Statistical Authority that they don't give you actual price per square meter per se, but they give you the trend and the volume that where the market is going in terms of volumes. George, sorry yeah. for interrupting, you can go. No, Christos, you spot on, and uh, Dimitri and Andonis, I fully agree. I mean, having, we operate in the UK and Cyprus as well, that the land registry is way more evolved than the land registry here in Greece. I mean, what I will say is that we need here in Greece transparency on transactional evidence as well. So I believe the government and the land registry has to play a major role as well in this. I mean, in, in the UK and Cyprus, you know, horizontally or vertically divided the next plot next door, how much has been transacted, when and where. And, you know, you can do proper analysis instead of here adjusting asking prices or having, you know, postcode prices. Uh, there is a lot of subjectivity uh, element there, which especially on the underwriting front, you can miss it completely. And uh, that's why, you know, our AVM model, you know, I am uh, the most uh, rigorous uh, critical assessor in-house because quite a few of the things don't necessarily work because we haven't got that transparency in transactional evidence. And uh, I mean, we're working with Do Value Cyprus, for instance. And you know, when they bring their analysis in their asset reviews, they know that George's plot is 100K because the next plot there has been sold in three in, in the last three months and it has been sold for 115K and is 50 euros per square meter. We have to, we need to have this across the whole Greece and it needs to happen faster than is currently happening because the evidence that we get here in Greece from the Ministry of Finance are not adequate evidence to do a proper job. This is what I'm saying. And I'm not being critical either to the government or any state's person. It's just we need to evolve if we want to have more investors, especially institutionals, coming to our country. Uh, we, we have, you know, something that we say here in Prospect is that instead of looking for data, we need to create data. So, you know, whoever is being involved in the process, we need to gather data. So, because I get a lot of questions, why, for example, that uh, with now we have uh, 1,200 properties, why we're collecting 300 data points per property? That question comes quite often to, to myself, why you're doing such an analysis on each of the properties. So, instead of looking, and I completely agree with George that, you know, the government needs to do what they need to do regarding the transactional data that are missing from the market. But I think each stakeholder in this value chains 
needs to start collecting valuable data for, from you know from each uh, side. I mean, from the technical side, from the commercialization side, from the REO side, from the auction side. If we if everybody has its own data, I think then we can somehow cooperate. The market can cooperate. It can do uh, great things together. Yeah, I mean, we need an MLS at the end of the day, most probably. Uh, something to aggregate everything together because uh, each broker and each uh, consultant, uh, obviously, you know, our data is our data and it tries to remain our data. So that's an issue. I mean, if, if what George happened doesn't happen, doesn't materialize, if the state doesn't intervene and actually record transactions and deals with the issue of some of the objective values, the tax access values, that will not happen fast enough. Just, just a small comment for the MLS. From the broker side, in order to have MLS, you, you need to have uh, sole agency agreements. Because if you don't have this, which in, in Greece it's not a common factor here, uh, you cannot not proceed with MLS. So uh, we have to start from somewhere else. Uh, we have less than one minute, I think. So uh, just to make the devil's uh, lawyer, uh, if I may say that, uh, I totally agree with Antonis uh, for the need of uh, data collection uh, with the need of technology and uh, that the technology can help us uh, do our work uh, more efficiently. Uh, I totally agree with all of you for the need of uh, AVMs uh, in order to make our life easier and more uh, quick, if you want. But uh, just a free question for all, for all of you. Uh, can AVM, AVM save our lives? Uh, do we need the human factor in this uh, scale and uh, how important is it? To be honest, uh, let me uh, jump in and try to give a framework on the discussion. Uh, the application of technology-driven solutions for underwriting projects uh, in grand portfolios are uh, basically of vital importance. Our experience from research sell-side securitizations, uh, mega securities, have shown that the use of enhanced AVM solutions uh, based on big data analytics and machine learning techniques are certainly beneficial. However, as you pointed out, the, uh, the important role and vital, I must say, is the role, our role of the real estate experts uh, in assessing and calibrating the output of these AVMs. Again, do they make sense? Any output of, uh, from the technology driven solutions needs to be critically reviewed by us and then uh, calibrated in order to be on uh, a frame of, uh, basically a pricing that uh, uh, makes sense. At the same time though, this kind of human factor that gives the input on this uh, and calibrates the output uh, needs to be on top and uh, on the technology software based solutions uh, that need to be continuously adjusted in order to improve and basically at the end of the day optimize the machine learning element. Um, that's what I think in the factor. I agree with Chris. It, it's a tool. Uh, it needs to be used as a tool. It cannot be a standalone uh, solution. So it's a tool. Uh, and because it, it feeds on data that's not there, uh, it needs lots of human intervention, especially the more granular you get into. And, and if I yes, may sir. add, that definitely the people said that data and with a lack of data that we uh, Adonis, Panos, everybody mentioned that we have a lack of data, so the AVMs on a standalone basis, in at least in Greece, um, can lead to very misleading conclusions. But I will say as well, unless we have uh, the match of demand and supply side data on a lot of points, what Adonis mentioned, the example I usually use is the following, two apartments on the same building. Uh, some of you must have heard it before. So two apartments on the same building, on the same floor, same square meters, same construction year, one facing the sea, the other facing a um, junkyard, front and back. So would an AVM come back unless you had all that this thing, or one hearing some noise from a school, the other being far away from the school. So th small things that make a huge difference. So I think that the, unless we, we reach the point of sufficient or extreme, I would say data points there, then we need to have the human factor uh, judging the results that, uh, as Chris mentioned, judging the results that you're getting. 
Uh, regarding your question, Janis, I, I'm not sure if ABM can save our lives. Definitely the customer experience can save our lives. So this is what we need to, to be focused and uh, we need to, to be transparent. We need to do things easy and we need to do things with, uh, with the right speed. Uh, it's all about customer experience. This is the future. Uh, you know, the younger generation comes into the um, situation in order to get into involved in the real estate business. Uh, they are more digitally educated, so they, they will um, uh, require uh, a good customer experience. This is what we have to be focused everybody here eventually. I, do not agree with you. I want to, to make a last uh, comment, if it's possible. Uh, we are speaking about AVMs that we are keeping uh, general characteristics of uh, any asset. But the real problem that we are facing, okay, we like the asset, we have the general characteristics. Can this asset be transferable? This data cannot be uh, controlled by an automatic machine. It's asset is one of a kind we must find the necessary data needed to see that it's uh, transferable the, uh, the property this is the, the key issue we have a lot of cases that the, the properties cannot be repossessed and we are facing problems and waste of time and money in order to repossess the, uh, the uh, properties and also regarding collecting the data why i put the existing owner the one that his asset will go to auction in the whole picture because he has data that we won't be able to have them after he, ha he can have a legalization with former laws we can take the, uh, this uh, from him this will win us money and time things that we can speak for uh, hours but my point of view is we must be 100% sure that the asset is transferable and each asset must be um, held case by case. Thank you very much. This is why we are talking about the human factor intervening in the machines. So uh, we are uh, seven minutes late in our schedule. Um, I don't know if uh, we are able to make a cycle to, for a closing comment from uh, each of our, of our participants, if Martin allows it or not. Yes, Hello. Uh, go ahead with the closing comment. It, I mean, there's so much to talk about on this panel, it seems a shame to cut it off uh, shortly. Uh, so please uh, go ahead. You, you are the best, thank you. So uh, I want a closing comment for each one and uh, I'll let you go. Hi, George here. Thank you very much for your time, Martin and Yanis. Uh, it's been a pleasure. The only thing that we haven't mentioned actually, and I think it's the future as well in, in Greece is bulk sales. I mean, we have, we're working now on three big bulk sales, more than 500 each in Greece. So it's something that we need to pick up on a separate conference, bulk sales of REOs, either on an SPV or um, uh, uh, assets consolidated on the bank's balance sheet. But uh, uh, um, I think the future will be promising. I'm glad that we see new companies coming in, more tech-based. And I think we need to evolve. We need more data, more transparency. We need the, the government to intervene and make the whole process of transferring ownership a lot smoother and a lot more transparent. That's it for me. Thank you. Uh, just very quickly from, from me. Uh, we need to close this on a positive note. It's, uh, Greece is the largest uh, NPL market in Europe currently. We have uh, the most transaction volume currently being closed or in signing phase in uh, 2021. And that's going to be the case uh, in the years coming forward. I mean, we still have a big supply of NPL. And uh, this pandemic will create a bit more, uh, you know, bad loans. So all eyes are on us and it's uh, up to us to deliver uh, uh, what we need to. So uh, my, my last word, if I'm allowed, um, challenges are here. We talk about uh, auction, we talk about our own management, we talk about commercialization of the assets. So there are a lot of different uh, steps in the process that needs to be fulfilled from many different stakeholders. 
So, you know, exciting times are ahead of us. So we strongly believe that um, technology and data will play, play a significant role on this kind of processes. And uh, we will be here to, to, to monitor the market and to, to do what we have to do. Dimitris? Yes. Uh, I didn't have time to analyze uh, what I said about uh, the, green, the green auction certificate. My co-speakers can uh, think about it. I am here to uh, discuss it again. And anyone that it's, uh, wants more details about this idea, we can uh, discuss it in uh, private also. We must, make, we must make the auctions friendly because we have huge numbers of assets coming from the NPLs. They will go through the auction uh, procedure because we don't have any other tool to proceed. Either they will go to REOs and then somebody will have to pay that or we can find a solution to do it before and to have more people interested in auctions. Right now, there is not more than 10, 15% of uh, the assets that are going to auctions that are going to uh, private individuals and they are not going to REOs. A very quick conclusion as well. Uh, it is important to improve the quality of available data, especially on the public registry, the technical chamber of Greece to share legalization data, as correctly pointed out, and the notaries to share detailed transaction data. Um, these have a major role to play, to be honest. Uh, this is another big project for Mr. Pierakakis, the Minister of Digital Transformation. Uh, I wish he could hear us and have been part of the discussion to give us his thoughts. So, thank you all. Thank you. Yeah, a yeah, last comment from me. Um, I think what we need to take into account is that up until very recently, the REO and the NPL market was mostly handled by banks. We have in the last couple of years starting to see the private side, if you want, and the investor side. Uh, coming into this picture and also the real estate companies come from the private side and investor side. So I think we need to rethink the way we're doing things, uh, summarizing a little bit, including the data and all the rest of uh, the things that uh, the previous the colleagues mentioned here. But I think we need to rethink how we're doing things and we need to challenge our existing uh, way of action and it is our opportunity here, apart from a challenge, to create, a, to create processes and to see things differently than what organizations like banks used to. So I believe one of the things that in Duvalu we're trying to do is organize things differently. Um, as I said, changing the modus operandi and, and producing results that we couldn't see before. So uh, Dimitris mentioned the 10, even it's not, I don't think it goes to 15%, I think it goes eight to 10%, but up, up until now, nobody was interested in actually promoting uh, the auctions or, or, or um, making the auctions friendlier to people. So generally, let's not go through details, uh, that would be my comment is let's change the way things are done. It's in our hands. Thank you. So uh, I would like to thank you, all of you, for your time. Uh, thank you, Martin, for the invitation. Uh, and I hope that uh, we will be able to meet each other soon, either for work or for uh, the next uh, session this October. Yanis, thank you, and lady and gentlemen of the panel. Uh, really, uh, sincerely, a great panel, great discussion, so much information there, uh, useful for, for us and our audience. And um, as Yanis said, uh, we, we hope we can, we can continue this uh, in a live setting, uh, as I mentioned to you in the pre-panel uh, chat. Uh, it will be my pleasure uh, to, to meet you in person uh, towards the end of the year when things get a bit back to normal. So my sincere thanks again, and uh, goodbye. Bye bye. Thank you, Thank you very much. Bye. Goodbye, everyone. Bye.